Now, we're going to be covering uh, quite a bit of doctrine in Genesis chapter 17. And we're also going to be kicking one of the heresies in Calvinism and some people who do not believe in dispensationalism but believe a form called replacement theology. For some people who are unfamiliar with that term, but you've heard it quite often if you've been in my Genesis studies, basically they believe the Christian church has replaced uh, the Jews and that we are genuinely Abraham's seed. Now Genesis 17 is going to be a good text to try to debunk that and it'll also debunk Judaism where Jews they do not believe in any New Testament application or doctrine that can be found in the Old Testament. So these verses will be very good to debunk both sides. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 17. Now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to read quite a big amount of verses first and then I'm going to examine the passage. That'll be easier for me. In verse 5, which we left off last time, but I'll just briefly review that. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For, the, for a father of many nations have I made thee. So notice right here that God, he changed Abram's name to Abraham. And Abraham means a father of many nations. And remember that Abram before meant high father. So the Lord, he actually humbled him where he didn't have any children. And then the Lord changed his name from high father into father of many nations. I put there in short, father of nations. Now we're going to see what he continued in his promise to Abraham. Verse 6, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. So God's saying, I'm going to make sure that your fruit, children born from you, is going to be exceeding a lot. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. God also said he's going to make sure that nations, plural, not one singular nation, is going to come out of Abraham, as well as many kings and rulers. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations." Okay, meaning that God says, I'm going to establish, I'm going to now launch and make a covenant with you. And this covenant is between me and you and your seed. So we're seeing Abraham's seed mentioned here. And God says, with your seed, whoever this seed is, let's just put it that way. Some people argue it's a church. Some people argue it's only Jews. For now, let's just say, it's the seed, whoever they are. God makes, makes a covenant with the seed after Abraham. So it's, he's going to make sure that Abraham's seed that comes out after him, after he passes away, after his timeline, that those people in their generations, that they will be what? That they will receive an everlasting covenant. It says, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. God says that the covenant is going to be forever. It's going to be permanent. And that he's going to be a God to Abraham and to his seed after him. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. So God says, I'm going to give to you and to the seed that comes out, uh, that to your seed after you, after your timeline, the land that right now you're being a stranger. Remember, he's living in the land of Canaan, uh, one of the Amorites, but uh, was it an Amorite or Ammon? I forgot. But anyways, uh, that land does not belong to him. So he's just, he's just being a stranger. He's a sojourner in that land, if you recall. And it says right here, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. All right. So the Bible says right here that he's going to make sure that the entire land of Canaan that he's currently residing as a stranger, it's going to be something where he can uh, possess it. He can own it forever. And the Bible also says that he's going to make sure that he's going to be 
their God as well. So uh, he's going to be Abraham's God and then the seed after him, uh, seed after him, God. Verse 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. So God says to Abraham, uh, I'm going to, uh, I want you to keep my covenant. So he makes a covenant. He makes a promise. He says, I want you to keep it. Uh, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. So therefore, like, uh, so as a result, uh, so what you're going to do is you, your seed after you in their generations, I want you all to keep the covenant. Verse 10, this is my covenant, which ye shall keep. So God says, uh, now here's going to be the covenant that I want you to keep. Between me and you and thy seed after thee. Between me and you and the seed that comes out after you, after your timeline. What covenant you're going to keep is the following. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. So God says that every male that is born from your lineage that's among you, make sure that they get circumcised. So that's what God says at verse 9. This is a covenant that I want you to keep, and that is circumcision, physical circumcision. So we see right here, circumcision is what uh, is the sign that God wants Abraham and the seed after him to keep. We're going to soon cover circumcision, which we know is something physical. It's a circumcising of a part of your body for the males. That's referring to, obviously, their private part, for some of you who didn't know. It's their foreskin in the biblical term. Now, the reason why they gave that practice, I'll explain a little bit more, but the Calvinists and some people, they argue, and even the Catholic Church did teach this. I don't know if they still do. But they always have a tendency, remember heresies are born when you spiritualize passages. So they spiritualize everything and they say that, well, what God was giving was a spiritual application. So it's purely spiritual, the circumcision is spiritual, and thus when we possess our own land of Canaan, it's in a spiritual sense. And that's why you got these kingdom builders, that's why you got Calvinists, falling into post-millennialism or amillennialism. And then you got Catholic Church who tried to build up their kingdom on earth through wars and inquisition during the Dark Ages. So why these both Protestants and Catholics have a distortion of doctrine is they think that these physical promises, the, this covenant that contains physical elements, they assume that it's all spiritualized to the church. And that's why, because we're trying to be, build God's spiritual kingdom on earth, they mingle the physical with the spiritual, and they think that they can build their own kingdom. Or some of them would think that building their own land of Canaan, right? We see all of this as heresy, and you cannot spiritualize passages. You take the verse as it says. Now, do I deny the spiritual elements here? No, there are spiritual elements and I'm going to show you verses on that. So Jews, they're going to argue and insist that we are the seed of Abraham, and hence that's why you have to follow Judaism today. Well, one, that's only in the Old Testament, and two, that's not entirely true. God, he foresaw something when he was giving that covenant to Abraham. He was foreseeing the Christian church. So yes, there is spiritual elements too. Well, then, this is so confusing. You're making it so confusing, Pastor. No, it's not confusing if you rightly divide here. Amen. Now, notice right here, and I've taught this in our previous Genesis study, so this is not foreign to you. God made the promise to Abraham's seed. But with this seed, there are two sides to this. You might say, why would God see two sides? Because usually when you read the Scriptures... God don't all the time sees one side. A lot of times he can see uh, multiple sides to it. If you don't think that's the kind of God you serve, you don't read that much Bible, actually. So God gave a promise to Abraham's seed, but then he's seeing a physical side to the seed and a spiritual side to the seed. 
So the spiritual side that he sees within this seed is the Christian church. The Christian church is the spiritual seed of Abraham. The physical nation of Israel, they might boast themselves to be uh, Jews and the seed of God, but the problem with their thinking is that if they have not received the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, if they don't have the Spirit in them, the Holy Spirit of God, then they are spiritually the children of the devil, and they will go to hell just like any lost Gentile or a person who is not a Jew. But the Christian church, then they take that pride and they act like the physical Jews, boasting we're the real seed of Abraham, and hence you guys don't qualify. The problem with this side is they don't acknowledge, and the Jews do have the point, let's be honest, if they were born from Abraham physically, come on, then they are physically still Abraham's seed. You cannot deny that. In the flesh, uh, they are children of Abraham, but in the spirit, see, they're still a child of the devil, a modern-day Jew today. So you can't deny the physical side. They are God's people. They are the seed of Abraham, but in a physical sense, in the fleshly sense. That's it, uh, na nationally speaking. So the modern uh, state nation of Israel today even though Judaism, we don't agree with Judaism, it's got a lot of uh, heresies today. Uh, I don't even believe in uh, the symbol of their flag and a lot of their practices. But the point is, uh, besides all that, we're not talking about uh, spiritual Christianity or right doctrine here. That's all in a spiritual world, spiritual sense. We're talking about physical sense. We can't deny that what they are, the Jewish people today, that physically, fleshly speaking, they are the seed of Abraham. So they are Abraham's seed. Now, to deny that is to deny scripture. You might say, why? Because, the, I mean, Abraham didn't give birth to his seed spiritually. Come on, use common sense. It was through physical encounter, physical birth, and everything was done, unless you want to spiritualize the whole thing. There's no way. Okay, you can't deny science, you can't deny physical birth and lineage. So, fleshly speaking, the Jews, uh, the modern-day Jews today, are still the people and the seed of Abraham. That's how you understand. So then this passage here, when God's talking about your seed, this is my covenant with your seed, you're going to see some parts that are spiritual and cannot be applied to just physical Jews. And then you're going to see other stuff in that passage that is physical and you cannot apply spiritually to the Christian church. That's why this whole passage you're going to read, you're going to see that. So why? Because when God's talking about Abraham's seed, he's seeing two sides here. So then he's going to say a lot of stuff about Abraham's seed. Now, that's not really confusing. It's like, for example, uh, when someone talks about uh, your seed and you have two or three sons, okay? Let's say you have three sons. Uh, let's put two sons to make it simpler. Two sons. And then let's assume God gave a promise concerning about your seed here, about uh, your children, and people start to talk about your seed and your children. And they said, for example, well, Gene, uh, let's say that one son became a school teacher, another son became a police officer. And then people start to talk about your seed. And they said, well, your seed, you know, it's going to, uh, you're going to have a police officer, they're going to be involved in the police force, and they're go also going to be involved with teaching in school. Now, does that mean then that... Uh, if one son is part of the law enforcement police force and then the other son is part of the school teaching business, that this side is going to be involved of the police force. No, it's separated from him. Right. Yeah. Does this son uh, going to be involved in school education? No, he's part of the police force. They're divided. So notice it's the same thing right here. See that? So notice right here that uh, God is... Uh, that. 
when the text is talking about, hey, this is a physical stuff, physical land grant, physical uh, people, physical circumcision, it's only going to apply to them. This guy don't apply those stuff to himself. And then if it was discussed about this other side of the seed, well, you know, you have to receive Christ for your salvation, the Holy Spirit of God, and it's going to be nations, plural, not just one, then we see right here that this side cannot take that for itself. Does that make sense? So basically, when things are discussed or talked about concerning your seed, you can see that, uh, uh, that these two sides cannot claim it for themselves. It's all distinguished for their own, but they're still part of that one seed. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have to understand that. We have to understand that. If we go to Genesis chapter 17, now let's see about Abraham's seed and then the distinguishing. We see, first of all, at Genesis chapter 17 and verse 5, God says, Father of not one nation. So you can't pick the modern, uh, you can't pick a modern day Israel today or Palestine, whatever you want to uh, call it. You can't just say it's one nation. It's many. You see that? Many? Yeah. Yeah. Many nations. You're going to notice at verse 6, it says nations of thee. So Abraham is not just the father of one nation. So many different nations around the world have to come out of him. Notice kings shall come out of these. So plural, kings as well. Plural, not just one king, but plural kings of different establishments. So we can see right here, you, you can't just apply it to physical nation of Israel today. Who are these guys? These are referring to the Gentiles, many nations, Gentile nations, who get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ and become part of the spiritual church. We're going to look at Romans 4 and Galatians 3. Galatians 3 and Romans 4. Galatians 3. And Romans 4. If you look at these two passages, Paul proves to the Jews from their own proof text that the reason why your religion is wrong, thinking that it's only physical Jews, that we're the only seed of Abraham, he brings up the clever argument in Genesis 17. So notice how Paul explained it. Look at Galatians 3. Look at verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. So if you receive Jesus Christ by faith, you're automatically uh, the seed or the ch uh, children of Abraham. Is that true? Verse 8 is powerful. And the scripture, what does it say? For seeing that God would justify the Jews, it says heathen, right? See, Jews not going to call themselves heathen. But God includes the heathen. Heathen through faith preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall one nation? No, it says all nations be blessed. Where, where did he get that from? You saw that in Genesis 17 and then... He's probably also uh, repeating a passage from Genesis 12. But the point is, is Paul used Old Testament proof text to show them, remember your Old Testament mentioned that, it's plural, nations, it's not one nation. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the who? Gentiles, see, not Jews, on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. So notice right here that God says that he made a covenant with them and that it cannot be broken. If we, well, keep your hand at Romans 4. Now, the other side, they're going to insist because they're anti-Semites, 
and they don't believe that the current Jews today, that they are the seed of Abraham, they're going to argue, that's why it's the Christian church. They're the seed of Abraham. And then they're going to read these verses that I gave to you. And then they're going to, this is one of their favorite proof texts, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So then what they like to argue is, this is referring to Christ's seed, only one seed. So you can't say church and Jews, that's two seeds. Did I ever say two seeds here? No, I said one seed, but you can have different sides coming out. It's that simple. They weren't reading. By the way, they're right. Christ seeds, right? Christ seeds. Okay, where was Christ born from physically? You can't deny that. From Jews, all right? But Christ is also the, uh, the line where he gives, uh, he paves the way for what? The spiritual seed of God. Unless you want to say that Christ is only of that spiritual seed and that's it. Then was Christ spiritually born? You want to make the virgin birth spiritual? Was he spiritually born then? Was he spiritually the Jew at, uh, during the time when he was uh, ministering the gospel? Let's put his death, burial, and resurrection just on a spiritual plane too. Yeah. No, it was physical, but also there were spiritual operations involved with those physical things he did. Yeah. See, you can't deny spiritual and physical sides. That's ingrained. That's ingrained. Uh, people don't really read their Bibles that well. So we see right here that uh, you can't just uh, insist that it's only physical Jews or it's only the spiritual ch uh, church. No, the seed has two sides to it. Now, another way that you can debunk the people who are for replacement theology is how are you going to then argue at verse 7? Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. All right, so remember, Abraham had a seed and a child right after him, right? That's Isaac and Jacob, okay? Now, they're Jews, right? Okay, aren't they Jews and physically speaking too from Abraham? Let's not talk about modern day Jews. Let's talk about Isaac and Jacob. Would you agree they're Jews and even physically from Abraham, right? They're not a Gentile, right? No, they're not. Okay, then how can you deny physical existence of Jews like Isaac and Jacob when the Bible says Gentiles who partook in the seed was in the future? Yeah, right. Then what was Isaac and Jacob? A pickaninny? A nothing? A nilch? Because read this at verse 8. And the scripture what? Foreseeing. It's in the future. That God what? Would justify future the who heathen not physical jews heathen okay physical heathen all right is isaac and jacob are they physical heathens no they're physically from abraham's line jews do you see that there so you can't deny physical jews you can't just say this is all spiritual no then what was isaac and jacob because they couldn't get this uh in verse 8, they couldn't get that. Yeah. that. That spiritual side had to operate in the future. Yeah. That spiritual side had to operate in the future through faith, right? All that operations by faith. They might say, well, you know, uh, uh, they did receive that too. Well, the problem is in verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shot up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. What are you going to say about that then? The Bible says salvation by faith did not happen officially during Abraham's time. It had to happen what? After the law of Moses. After Jesus Christ died on the cross. Then we could receive that. That's the problem with them. If we go to uh, Romans 4, notice right here. Romans 4. Verse 11, Romans 4, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, 
that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed uh, unto them also. So notice right here that circumcision uh, that Abraham received, uh, the Jews might argue you have to be physically circumcised, physically circumcised to be a seed of Abraham. But the Bible shows right here, no, it's all done by the operation of faith. So circumcision to this uh, Christian church is done at a spiritual operation. So we acknowledge that one. That's what the Jews are wrong. But we cannot deny that there's a physical side to the circumcision as well. So you got the Catholic Church, the Protestants, or Calvinists. They'll try to make this circumcision only spiritual. But that's not really true because read this part. The verse says that uh, in verse 12, and the father of circumcision, so Abraham's the father of circumcision. Let's say that's only spiritual, okay? That's only spiritual. So father of spiritual circumcision to them, what does it say? Who are not of the circumcision only. Wait a minute. Who are not of the spiritual circumcision only? No, uh, but who also walk in the steps of what faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Whoa, wait a minute here. Then we know verse 12 is talking about that when Abraham's a father of circumcision, it's not to only those who are physically circumcised, Jews, but also to those who receive Christ by faith for salvation. What does that mean? Abraham is a father of circumcision to uncircumcised people who receive Christ by faith as well as circumcised Jews. See, there's two sides. There's no way you can go around this. This circumcision has two sides too. There's a spiritual side, but also a physical side. There's no doubt about that. You'll notice right here that at verse 16, 16, therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise, right? What God promised Abraham in his covenant. Look at this. There's two sides. It's not just one. Might be sure to what? All. I think God said all the seed for a reason. Because some people are saying it's a one-sided thing. No, God's saying all the seed. Who's all the seed? God made it sure. Not just one side. All the seed Here's one, not to that only which is of the law, see, physical Jews, but to that also, see, including which is of the faith of Abraham. See, spiritual Christians, those who receive Christ by faith, who is the father of who? Us all. Don't be anti-Semite and don't be a prideful Jew thinking that the spiritual Christian church is not the seed of Abraham. Both of you are wrong. Abraham is the father of us all. All of us. So you have to understand that. So that is a proof text that's very powerful. Romans 4, Galatians 3 already, uh, that's a favorite, those are the favorite two chapters to, uh, for anti-Semitism actually. But those are the same two chapters that debunk anti-Semitism. I didn't go to any other passage. I just stuck with Romans 4 and Galatians 3. They didn't even read. All right, go to Genesis 17. Genesis 17. These, these people don't read their Bibles. These people don't read their Bibles. Now, let's keep reading, all right? Genesis 17, let's just read the text itself. There's no doubt that you can't deny spiritual things and physical things. So you have to put Israel and church, okay? For the Christian church, it's proven at verse 5 and 6, right? Nations. There's no, no way around that. All right. Physical Jew, there's no doubt. Why? Because it says in verse 8, the land of Canaan, wherein he is a stranger. Are you going to say that's a spiritual possession? Come on. You can't say it's a spiritual possession, spiritual land, unless Abraham was walking in a spiritual land. It's physical dirt, bud. He was living in that earth, okay? And that was the land of Canaan, unless it's a made-up fairy tale on some kind of invisible plane. So that's physical. So the physical land grant for a physical possession, you can't exclude the modern-day Jews. Some, some of them might say, well, no, 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 no. It belongs to me. 
some Catholic might say, or a Calvinist, or those who are anti-Semites, that the modern day nation of Israel is for me. Then you do this too, bud. Uh, what, what does it say right here? Uh, the verse says, at verse 13, uh, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant, that promise he made, yeah, that's for the Christian church, shall be what? Shall be what? In your flesh for an everlasting covenant. I don't think that's spiritual. That verse plainly said, in your flesh. In your face, buddy. Just read that passage, all right? There's no way you can go around that. It's an everlasting covenant, and he says it's something that's, uh, that covenant that he made with Abraham that's forever and permanent, that cannot be broken, he said that when you do that physical circumcision, that's a sign of that. How are you going to go around that? See, there's no doubt you cannot deny spiritual and physical elements to this. So this, uh, what you see in this board right here, this is a matter-of-fact truth. The seed has to have two sides. And that's why Abraham's promise is truly a promise. How are you going to make it as numerous as the stars? And how are you going to make it as uh, filling up the sand of the sea? Because you can't just fit it to Christians from the church for 2,000 years alone. You can't do that. That's too small. You can't just put it with modern-day Jews. That's too small. They make up, uh, what, 1% probably? Population or something right now? They're small. Unless you combine the two together. And then when you combine the two together, it can be as numerous. That's why truly that is God's promise. You're a father of many nations, father of many children. That's a wonderful promise. But to deny this side or this side, you break God's wonderful promise to Abraham. What God's beautiful plan to Abraham, I have a great plan for you. You're going to be a father of so many children that you won't even see it. All right. Now that we've uh, understood this, let's look at some of the proof texts that some of these people might use. Look at Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. So, some people from the Reformed Church, or Calvinists, they're going to use Hebrews 8, and they're going to argue this. They're so confused, and they think that the covenant that God made with Abraham here And some of them might go so far to say this. Well, yeah, I agree that it was physical back then, Old Testament, Old Covenant. But when New Testament came, when Jesus died on the cross, it's a new covenant. So this new covenant replaced the Old Covenant. So in other words, physical circumcision is replaced now with spiritual circumcision. Uh, the physical people is replaced with the spiritual people. That's what they're going to argue. Now, I already debunked that at Romans 4 and Galatians 3. That's already under the new uh, covenant, whatever they want to call it. That's under the church age. And then God recognizes, no, these are still my people. In the nationality of the physical fleshly sense. Okay? So, God recognized that. But... The circumcision, they go as so far to say, this is so hilarious. These people will say that this circumcision is actually baptism. Now, that's really wild. You know, these are guys, these are guys, these are the fools, the same fools that you onliners and some of you people get so brainwashed into thinking, John MacArthur is so smart. Well, Vody Bocham, man, that guy has so much wisdom. Oh, these Calvinists, these Reformed people, these are the same doo-doo, all right? Yeah. These dodo birds, man. From that bunch, they say that uh, water baptism. You know, Sproul, that guy, oh, man, he has a way with words, a philosopher. This is the same numbskull that think that, infants, uh, that sprinkling is okay. Maybe even infant sprinkling, too. But uh, these are the same fools from that foolish crowd that thinks, this circumcision is water baptism. Where'd you get that from? That's not even in the text. Where'd you get that from? You spiritual, I'll tell you how you get it from, because you're so smart. I acknowledge that. 
so you can spiritualize passages to somehow tie the knot to water baptism. And if you're so smart, you can do that. Just like the devil, he's so smart, he can take the scripture and twist it in a way and fool people. But it's so stupid and foolish at the same time. You might say, why is that? Because you're not reading the verse plainly as it says, and there's nowhere mention of water baptism. You have to be so brilliant to somehow magically put it in there. To make it stupid. Amen. So Hebrews 8 is our passage. Look at right here. Hebrews 8. Verse 7, for if that first covenant, they assume that's the Old Testament, had been faultless, then should be no place have been sought for the second. They assume that's New Testament or New Covenant. For finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So God's going to make a new covenant with this new Jewish people, probably, some of them are thinking, which is what? The Christian church who are the real Jews. But uh, one, it says house of Israel and house of Judah. When did the Christian church split to two sides, Israel and Judah? This is a physical nation of Israel. Unless you want to say that this was Christendom when we split off from Greek Orthodox and Western Roman Empire. Unless you want to say that. I never heard anyone saying that. I'm just helping out the heretics right there if they have no argument, all right? Verse 9, all right? Yeah, I'm helping them. I'm helping them. Because they need help. They need a lot of help. They have no scripture. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued on my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So it seems like right here that this old covenant is done away with. The Old Testament. So then God cast off the Jewish people then. Because they didn't follow the conditions of the covenant. See that? So then he's like replacing it with the spiritual covenant. So says the Reformed Church. So then they're going to say at verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Uh, verse uh, 13, uh, 12 and 13, 12 and 13. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So then the, the Reformed Church, some of them will assume this is referring to our salvation. When you receive Christ for salvation, your sins are forgiven, and you become part of the new covenant. In verse 13, in that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So they assume verse 13 is that old, coven, uh, that old testament is gone, and then the New Covenant, which is the New Testament, is being uh, replaced. So that's their assumption. Now, there are so many faults with this. One, uh, look at verse 13. It says, the, uh, the first covenant is what? Ready to vanish away. It didn't say it was done away. Why? Look, if you're a saved Christian, any saved Christian knows the Old Testament was already done when Jesus died on the cross. So then, this is not talking about Old Testament, New Testament. What are you talking about? So that covenant that, uh, at verse 9 is not referring to Old Testament covenant. This covenant that God is talking about, so there are several faults in verse 9, that covenant, because uh, they continued not in it, what did God do? God says, so thus, what I'm going to do at verse 10, I'm going to make a new covenant that's going to replace that old covenant. What does that mean? That does not mean that they assume that at verse 9, because they didn't follow the conditions of the covenant that God made with Abraham, God's going to cast away the people. No, God's pointing out this. In chapter 17, you'll notice right here at chapter 17, God made a covenant before circumcision. At verses 9 through 14. All right? 9 through 14 is circumcision. God already made the covenant at verse 5, 6, 7. That I make a covenant and he made sure to let them know, let Abraham know in verse 7 it's everlasting. Yeah. All right? Another one. In Genesis chapter 12, when God made a covenant with Abraham, that was long before circumcision. Right. There was no condition involved. Yeah. 
Chapter 17, first verses, no condition. Chapter 12, no conditions. And then chapter 15, he already made that covenant, and it's repeating Genesis 17. By the way, no conditions. It was unconditional. God knows that Abraham, your people, the physical Jews, it's everlasting. I'm going to make sure they get their land grant and that they're going to be uh, Abraham's seed and my people. So he's going to make sure of that in the physical fleshly sense, in the, nation, uh, in the nationwide perspective. Because there's no doubt this is nationwide perspective because when you look at Hebrews chapter uh, 8, Hebrews chapter 8, Verse 9 and 10, God is speaking to who? The same people, house of Israel, Judah. He never switched people. So he says that with this same people, house of Israel, that uh, the, old, uh, the covenant in what? At verse 9. This one is made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Not Abraham. See, in verse 9, this is talking about the Mosaic Covenant when they were getting out of the land of Egypt, when God put the laws. Why? Because the Jews didn't keep the laws. All right? That's a totally different covenant in verse 9. All right? If you think God only made one covenant with Jews, you don't read your Bible. In Genesis, we already saw God making many different covenants. Amen. He said, I promise what? Adam and Eve. I promise Noah this. I promise Abraham this. You think God only made one promise? I'll tell you what, the same, the Christian church, we don't even have one promise. We have probably 100 to 200 different promises. See, these people, they only look at one promise. So verse 9, it's a totally different covenant, okay? A promise that the Calvinists are thinking about. And Hebrews is talking about a different covenant. But this is the same group of people that God says that I'm going to get rid of that old covenant at verse 9 and replace this same group of people, modern day Jews, with a new covenant. Why? Because I made a permanent, a permanent promise with Abraham that you will be my seed. So I have to make a new covenant. That way I can keep this thing going. This new covenant does not abolish Jews. This new covenant establishes that God says, no, I'm going to get them back. Yeah, that's, that's what he said. Yeah. I'm going to get them back. That's why sometime in the future, the Jews are going to be restored. When they get restored, this is going to take place in the timeline of the tribulation. In the future. And then God fully establishes it at the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ, which is the millennium. So then he restores them because he made a promise to Abraham. He never forgot the Jews. And then he says, I'm going to, so that old covenant, they failed. All right. The Jews, they failed that old covenant. Whether Old Testament, New Testament today, they always failed. You might say, why did they fail? Because they just keep breaking the law. They just keep seeking after other gods. They, break, uh, they sinned against the Lord. So because of that, the Lord's like, well, here's the thing. I'll, I'll throw them off. No, he didn't throw them away. God's like, well, I made an unconditional promise to Abraham. It's going to be everlasting. But they keep breaking my law. So what am I going to do? God's such a brilliant God. It's not difficult. I'll just make a new covenant. Yeah. I'll make a new covenant. That way they can get back into place. Amen. And then when I cast them off, it's just going to be a temporary tie. Temporarily, I'm going to cast them aside. And that's why Jews today, they're temporarily cast aside, we see. And God is focusing on the church. Ever since the New Testament came in, God uh, gave up the Jews and went on to the Gentiles. Yeah. You know that, right? Yeah. That's all over the Bible. So God temporarily... Uh, postponed them, he temporarily cast them aside, and he said, one day, the sins of your nation will be forgiven sometime in the future, and I will restore you. That's why Hebrews 8, verse 12, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. He's not talking about an individual person's salvation. He's talking about that nation. He said, in verse 12, for I will I, and their iniquities will I remember no more. He's talking about future, not today. He's saying at the future, 
Unless any of you want to claim the promise of verse 12 that God's going to forgive my sins in the future, not now. How many of you Christians raise your hand and just want to sing and shout, what sins are you talking about? No, maybe you should change it to, what sins will you, will you be talking about? <laughs> See, this is, this is not a Christian. You want to claim it, Christian? All right, verse 11, I don't know how you debunk verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. For what? All shall know me from the least to the greatest. God says, don't tell them about me. Don't evangelize. <gasps> what in the world? What in the world? Then we shouldn't tell people about God or Jesus Christ or the gospel. We shouldn't be so winning. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? So that don't, uh, that don't apply to us. That's why. Because God, when he rules over the world in the future, everybody knows God. So God's like, don't witness to people about me because everyone knows who I am. How about that? They, they don't read the Bible. Now, match that with Romans 11. Now, see how this matches everything well with Romans 11. Romans 11. I read this over and over and over and over again, but some people don't get it, so let me read it again. Romans 11:25. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, God temporarily casts off the Jew, temporarily, mm -hmm. when he went to the Gentiles. And then he says, in the future, I'm going to forgive them of their sins and restore them. Yes, verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. See, when the Gentiles are fulfilled, their time is up, right? Because right now, Gentiles partake in it through the church. But one day, God's going to give up on those Gentile nations and go back to the nation of Israel. You might say, why? Look at the, today's Gentile nations. You yeah. think uh, they love the Lord, you think, when they sing God Bless America? United Nations, Gentile nations going downhill. So God's going to give up on them and go back to the Jews. If you keep reading over here, the verse says, uh, at verse... 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So notice right here, verse 26 says, all Israel, the nation, see it's a nation, shall be saved in the future. He's going to take away their ungodliness at verse 26. Verse 27, for this is my what? Covenant. That matches Hebrews 8, the covenant. Unto them which, when I shall what? Take away their sins. That's future. Shall, future. That, that ain't you. You want to claim verse 27? Then you're verse 25. You're the Israel that's blinded. That don't make sense. All right, go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. 17. Now, let's talk about uh, the most interesting part right here. All right? Most interesting part. So obviously it has nothing to do with the rite of baptism. Oh, by the way, uh, we don't have time to go there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if they insist that, well, this is a spiritual circumcision. So when a Christian gets saved uh, by faith, they receive a spiritual circumcision, and, that's, and that rite is water baptism. No, then 1 Corinthians chapter 1, what are you going to do with that? That verse says that Paul says, for Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Yeah. Why, that's a problem then. Mm -hmm. I thought we want to be, uh, receive that circumcision to prove our right that we are the children of Abraham. And then why, why would Paul dare to think that water baptism ain't that important? But that the gospel, getting people saved, is more important. See? So this has nothing to do with this, and water baptism has nothing to do with salvation either, that right. proves. All right, Genesis 17. And then we'll look at verse 10, uh, 11. We're going to look at verse 11. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall, uh, so the Bible says right here that God says to Abraham, so then uh, the foreskin, that's a part of your body that, are, that I already explained before, a part of their flesh that they're supposed to circumcise, so cut off. 
and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So God's saying that this circumcision is a token. It's basically a sign, yeah, all right? Good. It's a sign that, uh, of that covenant between what, uh, me and you. It's not a condition. It's more of a sign that confirms, that shows, that Amen. proof that whenever God sees that circumcision, I can't forget my promise. Amen. See? So if God's lying right here, then talk about circumcised Jews back uh, during the New Testament or even today, Jews who are circumcised, when God sees that, you think that God's going to forget his promise then? He made a token. See? He made a token. Whenever he sees that, that they're circumcised, that's reminding God, I can't forget my promise with you. Even though you anti-Semites do. And you poke fun at that about circumcision. And uh, no, you know, you're not the people of God. You're not the seed of Abraham. I am. Those same anti-Semites don't realize that when God sees those Jews instead, he says, no, I don't. When they mock you, I, I'm not mocking you. I remember my promise with you. Wow. All right. Uh, it says right here at verse, uh, so it's a token of the covenant between God and between uh, Abraham's seed. Now, I have to get down to this one uh, because time's almost up. Be, otherwise, I'm never going to get to this interesting teaching. I'll explain the other verses next time. But in circumcision, we know that has nothing to do with water baptism. But we're going to see some interesting things here on what Abraham had to physically do with this circumcision. In this circumcision, it all comes down. Think about this. When God did the circumcision, when God gave the promise of the seed, that all had to do with Isaac, correct? Mm -hmm. That all had to do with Isaac. Now, if you read Galatians 3, there's no doubt about that, yeah. and Galatians 4, yeah. Isaac is supposed to spiritually represent the new birth. Yeah. All right. So there is some sort of spiritual circumcision, some spiritual meaning behind it, but it's not in the Reformed theology sense, okay? It's not Reformed church's sense, okay? Yeah, so... What is it that God saw when he, told them, uh, when he told Abraham what to physically do through his physical seed Isaac and God was seeing how it would be a spiritual fulfillment to represent something else and to match something else? Well, first of all, it's this. Is let's see how Isaac can represent the new birth and with this spiritual circumcision. Let's look at Romans 4. Romans 4. First of all, God had to wait for Abraham and Sarah, both of them, to die. In order to have the seed come out, they had to die first. Wow, that's awesome. Romans 4, John 3. Romans 4 and John 3. When you got born again, church, when you got uh, the spiritual seed representing Isaac, someone had to die first. So that spiritual seed and that spiritual Isaac can come out. Wow. Look at Romans 4 and verse 19, 419. The Bible says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, Abraham's body, what? Now, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the, what? Dead. Deadness of Sarah's womb. Go to John 3. John 3. Let me know if I'm cut off, all right? Let's look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John 3. All right. Always catch me on that one. John chapter 3. This is the famous passage on the new birth, right? The spiritual birth representing spiritual Isaac. All right. The Bible says in John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. So the new birth. But someone had to die. Look at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must, see, this must happen, so the new birth can come out. The Son of Man be lifted up. Right. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. See, Jesus had to die. All right, another one. I want you to go to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. Circumcision, this physical circumcision Abraham had to do is such a bloody mess. I mean, you talk about a bloody mess. Why did Abraham had to do that? Because the reason why is he had to do that so that uh, later on God can uh, be able to, uh, he had to do that so that God can be able to show a spiritual meaning in the future. Amen. 
that bloody circumcision where, uh, where it was tied to Isaac being born, God was showing a spiritual meaning that when we receive our spiritual uh, birth, our spiritual Isaac, it had to go through a bloody mess as well. Amen. Look at 1 John chapter 5. Notice the new birth at verse 4, the new birth. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. See the new birth, right? But in this new birth, there had to be blood shed. Look at uh, the Bible made it very clear at verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water, what? And blood. God had to make that specific that uh, I don't want you to just think water. This is blood too. Don't forget the blood. Yeah. Why would God say it that way? Because right. he thought blood was important. Blood's important right. for this new birth. All right. So we see all over right here. We see at Romans 4. We see at John chapter 3. And then we also see at uh, 1 John chapter 5. And then also I want you to go to uh, Colossians 2. Colossians 2 and Galatians 5. Colossians 2 and Galatians 5. And then we'll close it off right here. Colossians 2 and Galatians 5. Now, uh, circumcision, there is a spiritual circumcision. So when Abraham was doing that physical circumcision of a cutting off of what God saw as grotesque, right? It's a grotesque part of the body for a male. And God said, that's just disgusting to me. And then God had to cut that off of Abraham. And, that, and it had to be tied to this birth of Isaac. Why? Why did God want that? Because in the spiritual birth where Christians are born again believers, we had to have a cutting off as well of something that's grotesque about us. And that is our flesh, our sinful Amen. flesh. Amen. Look at Colossians 2. In verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised. So we are circumcised, but not physically, with the circumcision made without hands. See, this ain't a physical circumcision, it's spiritual. What's the grotesque part cut off? In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See that? That's our spiritual circumcision. Why do you think Paul said this? At, keep your hand at Colossians 2, but go to Galatians 5. Why did Paul say this then? Paul said this, no wonder Paul saw it as because those Jews, they were trying to damn souls by getting, away, getting them away from the gospel, that Paul likened them to the spiritual meaning that these sinful Jews who are going to go to hell, that he likened it to a spiritual, uh, uh, he likened it to circumcision cutting them off. He likened them to a grotesque thing. And he said, I want them cut off. Wow, Galatians 5. That's how the Bible sees it. Look at Galatians 5. The Bible says right here in Galatians 5 and uh, verse, oh, I'm looking at chapter 6, sorry. That's why I couldn't find it. Galatians uh, 5 verse 11, verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach, what's the topic? So he had circumcision in mind, okay? Circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even what? Cut off, Cut off which trouble you. Yeah. He had that in mind. So he's saying, I wish that, and he likened them to what? Grotesque parts that are cut off, circumcised. Right. Now, why would the Bible word it that way? Why did Colossians 2 word it that way? Because all you have to do is go back to, the, it all comes down to the seed, right? Yeah. When you go back, all you have to do is go back to Genesis 3, the, the beginning of beginnings. When you look at Galatia, uh, Genesis chapter 3, what happened? The seed is corrupted. So God had to give a new seed that's going to make up for that corrupted seed of Adam's race. And then God said, your seed is messed up. And so I have to put a new seed. Look at from beginning to end. Satan always tried to mess up the what? Seed. If that thing happened with Eve, with the serpent at the Garden of Eden, Genesis 6, the seed was, tried to be mess, uh, was attempted to be messed up. With Noah, the sons of God intermingling with the humans, the seed messed up, attempted to be messed up again when 
Abraham had Sarah go with the Pharaoh. And then another mistake after God made the covenant too, again. And then we see that uh, all the time, the seed's trying to get messed up. Satan tried to destroy the seed. It's always the seed. You see the Jews, their seed got messed up when they mingled with the heathen and pagans. God wanted that seed to be separated so that his pure bloodline can come out with Jesus Christ. The seed was always messed up. And God told uh, Abraham, and let's ad lib it this way. Abraham says, why do I have to do this? This is so grotesque. Well, Abraham, it's because that your seed keeps messing up. And because your seed messes up, I want that cut off. And yes, something has to die. Blood has to be shed. It's a bloody mess. But, this is, but I want that to be done because it's going to represent this new birth and the seed, the spiritual seed that I'm going to do from your son Isaac. That's why. Man, that's phenomenal, isn't it? Colossians 2, if you go back to Colossians 2, verse 13. Remember, circumcision is mentioned at verse 11. Following that context, verse 13 being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he what? Quicken. See, something had to die so that he can be made alive. The new seed birth. Born again. Having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, what? Nailing, Nailing it to his cross. Blood had to be shed from the cross to wash away the sins so that God can operate this spiritual circumcision and give you the new birth. All of it matches together beautifully. Genesis 17, there is no doubt, you can't erase two sides. If you erase two sides, you erase a lot of nuggets and doctrinal truths. Physical side, spiritual side, there's too much in there. Father God, I want to thank you so much for the truth of your book and opening our eyes into how you dealt and how you worked with mankind. But it's blinded by heresy. It's blinded by one-sidedness. It's blinded by basically uh, anti-dispensationalism, rejecting dispensational truth. It's so eye-opening. I pray that these people will come to understand that truth and watch our video, Amazing Dispensational Truth, from Genesis to Revelation, and even by the booklet, and I pray that it will change their Bible study forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.